Chapter 14 The Worship of Images Deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 8 to 10 Thou shalt not make thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 8 to 10. This is an important and controversial text. There are great differences of opinion concerning this law between Roman Catholics and Protestants and among Protestants. Some Spanish Catholics have held strongly iconoclastic views. The difference is usually with regard to the nature of this commandment. Is it two separate sections, that is, one, no graven images, and two, no worship of them? This would make it two laws in effect. Some read the law as saying, Make no images or likenesses of any kind for the purpose of worshipping them. This latter reading is more in line with God's commandments concerning his sanctuary. A variety of images and likenesses are included, such as the pomegranates, the cherubim, the engraved laver, and more. God would not, in the very construction and furnishing of his place of worship, violate his own law. Clearly, the use of arts was not banned in God's instructions for his sanctuary. John Calvin opposed depictions of God the Father and God the Spirit. Having no visible, material form, any depiction of them would be falsification. On the other hand, he opposed the Anabaptist desire to smash existing sculpture and to deface paintings. He strongly opposed the misuse of art, not art itself. There is another aspect to this law which tends to be neglected in the controversy pro and con over the place of art in the sanctuary. In verse 9 we have the statement, I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. The Berkeley version reads, I, the Lord your God, am a God who brooks no rival. This is the key to understanding this text. God brooks no rivals. We can begin to unravel the meaning of this by citing two extremes. On the one hand, Baroque art, combining intense emotionalism with rationalism, left a sad legacy to the world. Arch released religion as the stimulus to worship. At its best, Baroque art was magnificent, but its intense desire to create a religious, even mystical experience through a deluge of ascetic flamboyance contributed to the exhaustion of the Counter-Reformation and to the idea of art as a substitute for religion and the artist as a prophet. On the other hand, the Anabaptist and Zwinglian emphasis on no visual art, on bare, whitewashed walls, and on no music, was equally a departure from God's law. It reduced religion to mystical experience, quietism, and, in too many cases, a retreat from both art and the world. Like Baroque Catholicism, it sometimes led also to a strong authoritarianism as witnessed the Mennonites and others, because it was a retreat from God's word to man's wisdom. God, in this commandment, forbids us from using our imagination or our ideas and concepts in framing, governing or guiding worship. The Westminster Larger Catechism says of this commandment, Question 108 what are the duties required in the second commandment? Answer. The duties required in the second commandment are the receiving, observing, and keeping pure and entire all such religious worship and ordinances as God hath instituted in his word 
particularly prayer and thanksgiving, in the name of Christ, the reading, preaching, and hearing of the word, the administration and receiving of the sacraments, church governments and discipline, the ministry and maintenance thereof, religious fasting, swearing by the name of God, and vowing unto him, as also the disapproving, detesting, opposing all false worship, and according to each one's place and calling, removing it, and all monuments of idolatry. Question 109. What are the sins forbidden in the second commandment? Answer. The sins forbidden in the second commandment are all devising, counselling, commanding, using, and anywise approving any religious worship not instituted by God himself, the making any representation of God, of all or of any of the three persons, either inwardly in our mind, or outwardly in any kind of image or likeness of any creature whatsoever, all worshipping of it, or God in it, or by it, the making of any representation of feigned deities, and all worship of them, or service belonging to them, all superstitious devices corrupting the worship of God, adding to it, or taking from it, whether invented and taken up of ourselves, or received by tradition from others, though under the title of antiquity, custom, devotion, good intent, or any other pretense whatsoever. Simony, sacrilege, all neglect, contempt, hindering and opposing the worship and ordinances which God hath appointed. These answers ably state the positive and negative implications of the commandments. They also reflect the belief in iconoclasm as calling for the removal of all monuments of idolatry, that is, all church art. This emphasis gave a simplistic way of keeping this commandment. Its application has been carried to great extremes, such as opposition to the presence of a cross in a church or on its steeple. All this has not furthered obedience to the law. Arminianism, for example, exists commonly in bare and often ugly houses of worship, but this does not separate it from idolatry. The Armenian insistence on man's free will creates in man an icon of radical independence from God. If man can choose or reject God, man is then God over God. His free will can frustrate God. This is as much a false god as any of the Balaam of the Canaanites. We must again cite Isaiah chapter 45, verses 9 and 10. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What makest thou? Or thy work? He hath no hands. Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begettest thou? Or to the woman, What hast thou brought forth? Thus, intellectual images must be seen as basic to idolatry. In fact, every pagan image embodies some intellectual premise, sometimes highly sophisticated ones. In Hinduism, for example, the various images represent a variety of concepts which seem intellectually astute and superior, but for one defect. They represent man's ideas about what ultimate power should be, and they therefore set forth a fallen man's vision and an evil one. Idolatry is not a primitive fact, but an aspect of a sophisticated development of false religions. It is unknown among the ostensibly most quote-unquote primitive peoples such as Bushmen, Eskimos, Hottentots and others. Idolatry is an intellectual development among the more civilised peoples because it represents the triumph of the human intellect in interpreting reality. Modern idolatry is purely intellectual in most cases. It has various names 
such as the Marxist concept of the materialistic determination of history, the idea of inevitable progress, the dogma of evolution, and so on and on. Idols can be objectified in institutions, ideas, scientific concepts, and the like. Freud, Darwin, and Marx have been important idol makers in the modern era. Basic to idolatries is a belief in a continuity of being between the natural and the supernatural realms. Given this premise, all reality is in a possible process of defecation. As the gods are now, so men in time can be, it is held. Quote, Mormonism, end quote, gives open assent to this belief. Such a faith creates idols out of its ideas and goes much further than some ancient pagan cults. God says that he brooks no rivals, and all forms of idolatry are thus doomed. He brings home to his children the consequences of an idolatrous generation to the third and fourth generations thereafter. Ideas and faiths clearly have consequences. Strictly speaking, the subject of images or icons can be divided into two classes. First, idolatry is clearly the worship of false gods. Second, iconolatry is the use of prohibited means and devices in the worship of the God of Scripture. Iconolatry works to deflect and pervert the nature of worship by introducing man's concepts into a revealed religion. Man must think God thoughts after him, but man too often feels that his supplemental thinking will improve on what God has revealed. In all iconolatry, man is worshipping his own imagination and reasoning 